Welcome to an EFL teacher hangout being streamed live on July 27th, 2011. Uh, and we're very excited to be joined by an EFL pioneer, renaissance man, uh, mover and shaker. You could apply whatever terms. Uh, Mr. Graham Stanley. Hey, Graham. Hi, Jeff. It's good to be with you. It um, is great. Moving and shaking here <laughs> in the Google Hangout, Google Plus. <laughs> and joining us in the conversation is the slightly audio challenged, but remarkably uh, moving and shaking himself, Vance Stevens. Who's just hello, a hello, how are you? Uh, yeah. and this is Jeff Lebo. We're I'm handling it. I'm in Pusan, Korea. And, and what a, a great group to hang out with because I've been hanging out with these guys for six years now. I think we first connected in 2005, 2006. Uh, and Graham has any number of EFL projects and quite a history we can talk about. But Graham, as I was uh, gathering my thoughts for our discussion, I wanted to start back in 1983 at the University of London, where a young Graham Stanley was studying modern history. Can you tell us a little <laughs> bit about that Graham, uh, why he was studying modern history, and where he thought he was going to head with that? Wow, you've really done your research, Jeff, haven't you? <laughs> I'll tell you, the Google, talk, the Google Plus profile page helps. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I... Uh... I went to the University of London. I studied at the School of Slavonic and East European Studies, which is a very small college. In fact, it's the smallest college in the, the University of London. And I studied modern history uh, with special reference to Eastern Europe. Um, and basically with the idea of probably, I didn't really know at the time, but I knew at some point I would end up being a teacher, but I thought I'd be a history teacher. So that was me back in 1983. So what happened ago. between uh, graduation and your your EFL career, your ELT career? Yeah, um, ironically, the rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, well, what happened was um, I, I always knew I didn't want to go straight into teaching. Um, something my my dad uh, told me. So it's a bit of advice that I listened to from my dad, who who he he was an engineer. He's retired now, um, but he always said he did a bit of teaching, and he always said that he thought the best teachers were those who actually had experienced life outside of education. So uh, a bit of work as well. So I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I thought I'd end up being a teacher. So um, when I left university, uh, it was a question of getting a job. And I, I actually did a, a lot of sort of temporary jobs in my first year, uh, not really knowing which direction to head off in, and um, ended up working for an architect. So I ended up doing administration for an architect's uh, practice that I just started in uh, in London, an American architect actually, uh, Skidmore Wings and Merrill, based in Chicago, and they just set up in London, and it was kind of the the boom period in London with uh, a lot of major development going on, such as Canary Wharf and Broadgate, two very big projects that this company were involved in, and I, I ended up being swept up in the uh, the building boom of that time. You know, the the company grew while I was there from 12 people to about 350 people within two years. And then I, I found myself after a year working for them in charge of uh, a, a team of 12 people. So it was very exciting. And I, I, I learned I learned some management skills the hard way, basically. I was <laughs> put in charge of uh, a department and people without any training. So. It was a very, very good learning experience. How long did that last, and how did you wind up in English teaching eventually? Yeah, well, well, um, there's a long story in the short story. I'll give you the short story. Uh, I left that company and started for another, uh, uh, started another architectural and design practice. Um, basically, I was headhunted, if you like, uh, there, and. Um, and then 
again moved to a Reaper graphic company. So I found myself um, the year before I left for to become a teacher working at a Reaper graphic company doing a lot of um, what we were doing was uh, it was a, um, a scanning department so we actually uh, the people that were in working in the department were scanning architectural documents and providing electronic uh, um, copies of them for the architects and sending them over the internet so back in I think um, well, this was 16 years ago and uh, I think what I left out was I started using computers when I was at my first job and I got really interested in in that and so um, we were doing a lot of data entry and uh, that moved on from data entry to uh, other applications and I started doing a little bit of um, I trained on a CAD program and I got interested in in that side of things really teaching myself how to use computers and uh, database programming and stuff like that. Uh, we'll have to hear the long story in the post show. It usually The long story usually involves a woman. <laughs> yes, I've left that part out. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when did you finally get into uh, language teaching? What year? Um, let me see. It was 16 years ago, 16 and a half years ago. Okay, so 95-ish? Um, yeah. And um, Vance, I started using computers, I think, um, probably 1983. Yeah, I, no, not 1986. 1986. Okay, and Vance's yeah, question was when you started using computers, 86. So this is kind of pre-internet in any uh, meaningful yeah. way. Yeah, yeah. The, All right, so the first computer I used was an IBM PC. Tell us and a little bit about your Mac your early language teaching career. Where was it? What were you teaching? How did you feel about it? Yeah, well, I, I kind of decided that I wanted to try teaching. I knew it was on the card. So, um, and um, after a number of options, I, I um, possible options, I, I decided the best place for me to go was Barcelona uh, because there I could take a... Um, an initial teacher training course to get me started and then I always had the idea of moving south to Seville because it was a place I would visited before and uh, thought it would be a great place to uh, to uh, to live and to work and then um, so I did my teacher training course um, in Barcelona and when I arrived in Barcelona I just decided why do I want to go South, this is such a fabulous place. I want to stay here, and that's where I've been ever since. Um, did you start using technology right off the bat, or did it take a while? Um, what happened was I didn't have access to a computer then. I basically sold most of my possessions or left them behind to come with a suitcase over to Barcelona. Um, and the first year I was teaching just outside of Barcelona, what happened though was that the there was a, a Mac in the corner and it was hooked up to the internet. And the it wasn't really for our use though, but the, there was one teacher who, who was using it, who he would actually go to CNN and get us um, lessons that CNN were producing, gapful exercises, etc. And my first uh, experience of using the internet with students was one day there'd been, um, we came into work at about five o'clock and a couple of hours before, I think, there'd been a, a bomb attempt by ETA, the Spanish, the Basque terrorist group, on the, um, on the uh, life of uh, Maria, Jose Maria Afna, who was uh, not in power at that time, but was the opposition party leader and uh, CNN had produced a gap fill for it and we had it as a photocopy and so my students walked into the classroom we were able to do this and they didn't know this had happened and I just thought wow what what an amazingly powerful tool that is to bring the news into the classroom uh, you know in such a way and that was my first experience of the internet in the classroom 
Uh, now, I checked out your blog, and it looks like blogefl.blogspot.com started in 2003. Is that when the blogging began for you? Um, yeah, I think it was 2003 I started that. Um, another, a, an accident really. I started blogging. I'd been invited to blog it by a friend of mine in England who'd come across it and said, oh, I'm sure you, you like this, and uh, set up an account. And then, like a lot of people who set up blogs, I wrote one post and then forgot about it. <laughs> and um, uh, then what happened was that I was working at the British Council in Barcelona then, and on a summer course, and I blo blocked um, all of the this computer room time because there was a new system that the British Council were bringing out, a community for learners. And I thought, all oh, right, this would be fun, fabulous to use with my students. And by then, I was um, uh, in the middle of a master's uh, degree in ELT and educational technology through the University of Manchester, and I was very interested in experimenting with all sorts of um, things in the classroom. And the day before the course started, I was told by my teaching centre manager that they wouldn't be able to uh, register the students for that community, that I couldn't use it. And so I was, oh dear, okay, so I have all this time booked, uh, what do I do? do? Do I use something else? And I remembered the blog, and so I kind of set up blogs with my students back in 2003. These were teenagers. I had two classes and had them um, post various things they were interested in and communicate with the other students in a very sort of basic way. But um, I just, it, it was a real eye opener. And what happened was after class, I, I kind of, the first day I just saw the potential was was amazing. I just decided I, I want to know more about this, so I started investigating and trying to find other teachers and to find out what what other people had done with blogs. Of course, that was um, right at the beginning of the blogging boom, really, or before it was uh, popular. And um, and I came across uh, Barbara Jur and uh, Teresa Dalmeda in Barbara in Brazil and Teresa in Portugal and they were both blogging they'd started before me inspired by I think Aaron Campbell in Japan in Kyoto uh, who had written an article about blogging and started right right at the beginning and um, Barbara and Teresa were, were fabulous they'd been both blogging with their students Teresa had been blogging with very young learners and Barbara with uh, that's B with um, with the uh, secondary school students, and we started collaborating, and uh, I started writing on their blogs, and and well, on 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 B's blog, and and um, getting really into it. Uh, and Vance so in the back was... channel chimed in that he, that's the same year he started blogging, and I'm curious, <clears throat> how first of all was that successful at that time, and. How has the blogging, you know, we were just in an ELT chat talking about technology and, and language learning. And these days, I mean, blogging is still part of the picture, but we're more dazzled by media and mobile and Second Life and things like that. And I, you know, I noticed on your uh, blog EFL uh, blog that in 2003, you had 187 posts, 2004, 202, and 2008, 10, 2009, 8. So the the amount of blogging has really kind of diminished. How, as you look back at blogging, did it peak? What have you learned? Is it still effective? And Vance, please feel free to chime in here as well. Yeah. Well, um, I'd, I'd like to say first, uh, through it was actually through B and Teresa and through blogging that I came across the webheads and uh, got to know Vance. And the fabulous community that uh, that he set up. Maybe, maybe Vance, you could tell us a little bit about you blogging back in those days. I'd like to hear about that, actually. Uh, yeah. So, well, we started Webheads, and I guess we met B and Teresa uh, in 2002, 2001 December 2002 was when that course took place, 
and um, so that's uh, I, I can't really remember exactly the interactions back then, but um, I myself uh, changed jobs in 2003. I was working for Amit East, uh, setting up a language school, not as a teacher, but as a kind of a, uh, I was responsible for educational technology in the language center where I was working. And um, so I took on a teaching job, uh, which was actually a job to teach computing. And, but in that first summer, um, I took a, some high school students who were coming to the Petroleum Institute where I was starting to work. and. Uh, they were just in a summer program. It's sort of to introduce them to the institute. But there was no real program for it, like a lot of things, you know. Like this program, for example. <laughs> but anyway, so basically, I, I had them for like three hours a day. And the way I, I had them in class, um, the first hour and a half, I would bring them things, maybe, you know, games on the internet, let's say. Uh, there was some, uh, for example, there were some games that you could. I think there was the tower of something. The tower. Do you remember the 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 website back then called the tower of something? I used that a lot. Uh, I can't remember its full name. I'll have to look it up. But anyway, uh, this guy had a lot of really interesting uh, uh, internet activities, and I would bring them the first hour and a half. And then those guys they were starting to stand on the chairs by then, and and they were. So I took them to the lab for the second hour and a half, and I just got them all blogging. And they were they their their English skills were very poor, and they would write a sentence, and then I would say, okay, we'll write another sentence, you know. And the next day they'd come with another sentence. I, I noticed that they would play around during the class a lot because they're just young kids. And but the interesting thing was, this, the next day they would come having written two or three more sentences, you know. They were actually doing this at night at home, and then one guy um, wrote about his Marvel collection. And we got a comment from a teacher who was coming to the UAE who said, oh, gosh, I'm so glad to know that the kids there are just like me, which is the way it is. You know, it's really true. So, uh, you know, we got some really interesting interactions there, and I thought it was a very worthwhile thing to do. And um, so that's how I got keen on blogging. Uh, and then, of course, the most interesting thing we did after that, I guess, was writing Matrix. But uh, and that was, and I, I wrote an article with uh, with B also on aggregating. <laughs> interesting noise. <laughs> but anyway, so well, okay. This is and, an interview of Graham. Let's and go I'm back. And I'm thinking <laughs> this was TowerofEnglish.com, perhaps. That was it. Tower of English. Yeah, that's right. Uh -huh. Yeah, I it's a really cool ESL site. Tower of something. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah, I wonder what's happened to it. So, uh, Graham, back to your blogging, your, your blogging in the class efforts back then. Is it still part of your teaching and or your training? And why did you only have eight posts in 2009? No pressure or anything, just wondering. <laughs> yeah, no, um, it's, it's definitely something I'm still interested in. But it's, um, it's like everything, really. I mean, I find myself being attracted to emerging technologies. I think that's really what gives me a buzz. So um, after blogging, um, I moved on to podcasting. Podcasting was uh, something I really wanted to investigate and did a lot of that. And then that led me, I think, to yourself and World Bridges and EFL Bridges. And then we did uh, that EFL Bridges um, World Conversation Club for about a year. And, um, Can you tell us a little bit of, and this is just one of my favorite <laughs> chapters in internet history, and Graham was just brilliant and saintly in this endeavor. Can you tell us a little <laughs> bit about what that was and, and what you learned from that experience? Uh, yeah, well, um, I think it was through listening to your shows, Jeff, that uh, the um, EdTech Talk uh, which you know, when, when did you start set up EdTech Talk? Two thousand five. Two thousand and five. Okay, so um, this was around the same time that we kind of the webheads sort of became involved uh, with World Bridges. I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. That is but, correct. Uh, and um, and then I remember that you you'd basically uh, bought about 
two million domain names. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> related to bridges. <laughs> and um, had started running lots and lots of different shows and had uh, all of these wonderful ideas of um, of how you could build a webcasting network. And I must admit, I, I learned so much from uh, listening into those EdTech Talk shows and the World Bridges shows, and we were really inspired by that. And then I remember online one day when I <laughs> was talking to you, uh, um, being challenged, if you like, to do something for learners. So I, I you threw down the gauntlet. <laughs> People keep Which... telling me these stories. I don't remember them. I, I guess they're true. I'm sure. I'm sure there's an audio record of this. <laughs> Good luck finding. We looked it. hard enough. <laughs> but um, so I picked it up and I thought, okay, I'll give that a go, and um, and so that was really the birth of this. World Conversation Club, which uh, was a very interesting time, I think. Um, it, it, it was, um, you know, a lot of the time it was once or twice a week. Uh, most of the times it was me getting up very early on a Sunday morning while my wife was still in bed and um, connecting with whoever would want to um, on Skype. Uh, were these we the had days Skype of Skype casts? casts? Yeah. Yeah. At, at the beginning, it was just Skype. And that was really quite difficult. That was quite a challenge, getting an audience, getting people to join you, because you had to sort of find people to come and join you. But with Skypecast, it was uh, very easy. I mean, I think a lot of people listening to this maybe wonder what a Skypecast is, but it was basically a public conversation that was advertised to anyone in Skype, um, and they could come and join you. So I remember there were there were some days when you know I switch on the setup and we were streaming as well. Um, I learned how to stream thanks to you in the Webcast Academy, um, and um, nobody would turn up. So I was sitting there on my own <laughs> and just waiting for somebody to turn up. And then there were other days when I'd be joined by one or two people and, you know, the conversations that we had were, were really interesting. I think um, uh, Scott of uh, Tokyo Calling fame in Japan, what the Tokyo was Japan's first web podcaster, uh, joined me quite a few times. And that was great because I think these things really work if you have a co-host Otherwise, it can be quite lonely. Um, so when Scott joined me, uh, it was fantastic. Plus the fact that he's just a really interesting guy anyway. So if nobody turned up, then we could we would just chat together anyway. But uh, then um, there were other days when we had you know hundreds of people in the Skype cast, which was very difficult to organise because first of all you had to mute everybody, and then it was very difficult because you had to they had to indicate if they wanted to talk and then you would unmute them and normally is the most you would get out of them is hello how are you or you know a little few words about where they're from but not really any interesting conversation um so in the end after about a year i decided enough was enough and uh, i needed to uh, to to do other things and my my wife was actually getting a little bit tired of being woken up on a Sunday morning <laughs> with all <laughs> with the sound of my my voice. <laughs> I'm sorry, we, we can't hear learners. you. We can't hear you. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, I mean, the audio quality was just, you know, people just weren't as familiar with, with how to do audio settings and things. And so audio quality was a challenge sometimes. But you managed to have some really yeah. interesting conversations. I remember you had political conversations, I think, like Middle Eastern politics. You had MC yeah. Hammer stop by. Um, yeah. I mean, those are the two. Those are the two. The two you mentioned. The two most memorable sessions were, uh, we had a a, com a conversation with MC Hammer, but we didn't realise it was MC Hammer until afterwards. <laughs> so he introduced himself as the the MC. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and you know yeah. those were just so, kind of wild days. You know when when kind of that podcasting era hit, and I think. 
we've had a few waves of the internet, but I think on the education front, people were really juiced. Feel free to unmute at any time and, and chime in, Vance. And I'm wondering, like, when you go back to that time and think where we were going to be at in five years, are we there? Did things evolve differently, more slowly, more quickly than you expected? Do you want to say something about that, Vance? Well, you know, actually, what I was just dying to mention was that um, I put the link in the chat about the article that Graham wrote called Podcasting Audio on the Internet Comes of Age. And the reason I asked him to write that article was that was at a time when I didn't really understand podcasting. And, you know, I, and Graham was talking about it and... Uh, so I actually got Graham to teach me about podcasting by getting him to write that article, which he graciously agreed to do. And so in editing it, I would come back with some kind of, you know, silly questions. Oh, explain this more thoroughly, you know, that sort of thing. But it was actually getting him to tutor me in, uh, in what it was all about. And so that's uh, <laughs> kind of a neat little aside there. And I, too, used to listen to those broadcasts. I've, I listened to a few EFL Bridges uh, podcasts, which I, I have to say, I probably stopped listening to them after a while. <laughs> but anyway, but I certainly listened to back then, and I still do. I still download the uh, the uh, EdTech Talk, uh, listen to Paul Allison quite a bit, and uh, even uh, catch some of the other, uh, Bob Sprankle and, uh, and those uh, the wild people who moved on in their own podcast now. But anyway, yeah, and, and I try to get EdTech Weekly. I'm a real fan of EdTech Weekly. That's my favorite. I, I know. They've become real slackers, though. They keep taking long hiatuses. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, and they keep trying to restructure the program. It was fast-paced. <laughs> now it's not fast-paced. You know, it's hard to sort of get a handle yeah. on it. A lot of reflection. <laughs> I certainly like it. Um, and, and, and Graham was just so saintly in how he would deal with it. Just, I, I was always struck by how patient Graham was. I... Uh, I'm sure that serves you well in many other things. But back to my question about how things evolved to, to either of you. Uh, have things evolved in the way you would expect? Well, if I can say something about that. I think um, I think back then it, it was that. Uh, you know, the title of that article was podcasting, uh, you know, audio on the internet comes of age. And it did feel like it was an exciting time for education, for, for audio. And I think podcasting has really, it, it overhauled, just as blogging has overhauled uh, so many different aspects of, uh, you know, society, you know, journalism is not the same now that blogging's happened. Uh, I think pod podcasting has done something similar to radio. Um, and they both found their place. But what's interesting for me, I think, is recently I've seen all these, I don't know if you two have, seen similar articles, but I've seen these articles about podcasting saying the gist is kind of like, whatever happened to podcasting? A lot of people seem to think that it hasn't fulfilled its potential. I think it, it promised so much and it seems to have sort of um, not uh, advanced as much as people thought it would. I think I'm not sure if that's true, that line of thinking, and uh, I'd love to hear what you two think about it, but I think one thing that has happened is that a lot of the mainstream media seem to, uh, they seem to have hijacked podcasting, and, uh, you know, most of the podcasts on iTunes are all about uh, uh, mainstream media providing audio, um, which you can get elsewhere as well. Um, there are um, a number of people who are producing audio to promote uh, films and, and other things, or so extra audio for TV series and films, etc. But the kind of homegrown podcasting, the, the kind of stuff that um, Scott and Japan was doing and the, the educational stuff that was going on then, where the audio quality wasn't so so great, but it was the content that mattered, not so much the quality. That, a lot of that seems to have just sort of disappeared. I don't know what you two think, but that seems to be the case, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think back then it was kind of envisioned as this whole new alternative media. And, and I think new media and old media have merged a lot. I think it's been just 
podcast, I, I also think the name is a little bit limiting. I mean, really, it's online audio. Uh, and I think that's been integrated into stuff. I, I think a lot of the early podcasters were trying to emulate traditional media. Hey, welcome to my podcast show. This is, so, you know, and I think some of them worked, but I don't, I don't personally think that's where the power is. I, I think the real magic happens in the long tail. It's not the shows where you get, you know, 10,000 downloads a day or whatever. It's in people finding other people to have their conversation they want with and, and being able to connect to that conversation. Um, like the, the World Conversation Club, I mean, I, I think for language learning, that's a great scale. I think if you can, you know, organize this kind of converse, global conversation practice, that's really powerful as a learning tool. Um, people are, you know, producing lots of podcasts still, and they're finding their audience. It's not huge audiences uh, necessarily, but it's it's the, the appropriate audience. Um, yeah, I don't know. Well, I, you know, one thing, one, one application of podcasting, which uh, I, yeah, as I mentioned, for the Petroleum Institute, I was teaching computing, and I was working the last year, my last year there, I was working with uh, uh, English teachers and developing some materials for them. We had a, a sort of a, a, a course that went together. So I got to sit in their meetings, and I uh, had some ideas every now and then. For example, I found out one, one of the things they were trying to do is they were, they had some reading passages they were trying to record. They thought the students would benefit from hearing the reading passages, so they were going to record them and put them on tape. And they, but they, they didn't have enough um, speakers. You know, there was always a problem trying to get someone to read these passages and make a recording. I said, well, why don't you just blog them? You know, just put them in a blog and then put AudioGo there. And AudioGo, of course, will make a podcast out of it, basically, you know. So, bang, instant instant podcast. So, if you, you know, you think in terms of that, um, there's so much you can do. Um, just by blogging, by yeah, just by blogging something, anything you blog, you can you can get a podcast out of it very easily. So, you know, I don't know if other people are, are doing a lot of that kind of thing, but uh, or if that's a good idea. <laughs> the English teachers never did implement it, but I, I I hope my next job is teaching English, and then I'll I'll have a chance to go with that. And and for those of us who still prefer the audio medium. Uh, I still listen to more podcasts than I will read long online articles. So for those of us who are uh, auditorially oriented, uh, we're still tuned in. Um, now, Graham, you've managed to stay busy since then, uh, have been involved in any number. You were mentioning that emerging is sort of where your attention goes. What kind of emerging have you done in recent years? And feel free to go. You could talk about a planet or your second life endeavors or any number of things uh what's had your interest in recent years yeah well um yeah you're right uh uh <clears throat> I'm, i got interested in second life as a uh, and virtual worlds in general as a when, when they became uh popular um a number of us yourself and vance included as well uh were to be found wandering about uh, in 3D worlds, <laughs> meeting all sorts of people. I think one of the great things when when you get involved in a uh, with a technology right at the beginning, um, then you do get to meet some very interesting people and uh, and have some interesting experiences. Uh, and it was really quite exciting uh, um, when that first happened, and um, that led to. A European Union project, which was uh, called Avalon, which uh, um, is now finished. It finished in December this year, and uh, you know, trying out teaching languages and teacher training in Second Life. Um, and I think Second Life has really found its place. You know, a bit like podcasting, it it doesn't have a lot of publicity anymore. But the people who use it are using it uh, um, well, and they've, you know, in education, I think there's a lot of. It seems to have gone into the universities. That seems to be my. Um, take How on. does it get used well? Uh, and for all those teachers out there who might say, "Oh, I don't know, man. It's uh, too difficult to use, and I could never do this in my classroom, and have any number of excuses not to do it." 
What's your, not your pitch, but how is it getting used effectively? Yeah, I think it's it's a kind of thing that does, it's, again, it's never really fulfilled its potential. I think a lot of us back in the heyday of Second Life when it was capturing, you know, mainstream media attention, you know, TV documentaries were made about it. It was in magazines all the time. Uh, thousands and thousands of people were lured into using it. Um, they felt they thought it was a way of getting rich quick or <laughs> or or god knows what but um for ourselves i think it's proven to be a fabulous way for teachers to meet in an interesting environment so long as you have a decent enough computer and internet connection to allow that to happen um so the events that take place once every month there's a second life um, experiments group of language teachers who get together and and um, on education and they meet and they share um, tips etc outside of that there are people who socially do various things in Second Life uh, so there's a lot and there's a conference in September that it'll be there I think the fifth Second Life um, languages conference will be taking place in middle of September I think um, and uh, I have a couple of kind of interjection questions. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. One is like uh, professional development seems to be happening there. And most of my experiences have been hanging out with other teachers as opposed to being involved in language learning. Um, yeah. And the other thing that just struck me as you were speaking, because I've had more than a few campfire chats, most of the people that I know involved are 40 somethings and 50 somethings and not the spring chickens that you would tend to think gravitate yeah. toward emerging technologies has that been your yeah. experience and what's up with that yeah you you're right you're right but then um yeah i mean i think what what is it about that um i think there are people who use second life at home, maybe because they uh, spend quite a lot of time at home for various reasons. Maybe they've got a family or for other reasons. Um, and uh, this is an interesting way to connect with other people. So I think there's that. But um, hmm. I think the other thing is that if you look at what options are available to younger people that second life is not a game and graphics wise etc it leaves a lot to be desired uh, if you're used to playing uh, modern console games and second life is very clunky um, you know that's not the point of it it's it works as a social network I think it's a great place to meet people but in hmm. your recent session for Vance's learning together uh, thing last week it was not just about Second Life, it was about kind of virtual gaming kinds of environments. Um, can you talk a little bit about the actual, not professional development, but actual language learning that takes place in Second Life and these other virtual yeah. worlds and where you think it's heading? Yeah, well, you know, during the Avalon project, we did a lot of uh, pilot courses with different levels of students in different parts of the world. And, um, you know, um, the ones I, w I was involved in were, there were two courses. We, we piloted the, a business English course, which was based on the Dragon's Den TV program. If you know that, it's like a business um, competition to set up your own business. Um, and they were basically groups of students preparing and developing uh, a business plan, which are then presented after the end of six weeks to a group of business dragons who were um, giving them feedback on the business idea as well and a lot of the language learning was very informal and it came from the language that was being used by the students what they needed to do the negotiating the presentation uh, skills etc um, so that was piloted that that I think is we, we did two pilots we did a pilot at B2 level if you know the CEF, the European uh, 
level. Um, I, I don't. That is like I a, have no idea what you're talking that's about. Like an upper intermediate level. The okay. European there's a European framework for reference for languages, and they have these sort of um, they they cut across lots of different languages, and they have um, it goes from uh, A1 up to C2, and A1 and A2 you've got A1 sort of beginners, if you like, when you achieve a, an A1 level, you're, um, you've you studied about a, a hundred hours, perhaps, of um, language, and it goes on. B2, which is like just moving into upper intermediate level, the business English course and second life uh, teaching in general seem to work much better than at lower levels. So we found that students that were A1 level or A2 level had tremendous difficulties. Um, first of all, it was the, the language um, that they needed to be able to get into Second Life and start using it was sufficiently difficult that it was you know, a challenge. So the dropout rates were higher. Subsequent to this Avalon project, the business English course we've been piloting it with uh, teachers in uh, sorry students in Tunisia in the university in Tunisia with the idea of actually um, the British Council uh, rolling it out across universities in Tunisia and that's still sort of being decided whether that's going to happen or not whether the Tunisian uh, education department is interested in it if they are then that could mean quite a substantial uh, amount of classes and teacher training uh, that will be involved in so we have to wait and see and that could also expand to Egypt as well um, there's a possibility anyway uh, again what we found was the B1 students the upper intermediate students they loved it they, they took to it like a house on fire they, they, they it worked really well and the conversations that came out of it and the reaction of the students was fabulous and then the lower level students uh, a lot of them dropped out before the end of the course so I think that sort of emphasizes for me the the idea of using Second Life as a as an extra component this was a blended course that the students know each other at university anyway that they they use it as an online component where um, for meeting and practicing language um, in an interesting environment when they have access to uh, you know decent computers with a good internet uh, uh, connection it really works it really works very well and it seems to be a memorable way of doing online learning I mean at the moment we the three of us are, are in a uh, online space um, and we can see our webcams that we're talking heads but in Second Life, you get so much more flexibility and freedom of changing where you are, who you're talking to, what kind of things you see. And it makes, it's that visual element for me and for a lot of other people, I think, that makes it a memorable experience. You know, I remember a lot more vividly times that I've spent with people in Second Life that I was sitting, uh, drinking a cocktail on a beach watching a, <laughs> a sunset and talking to people that that's a, a very uh, memorable experience much more memorable than any other kind of online learning synchronous experience that I know or even asynchronous you know so I think that there's power there's a power there that uh, that um, has yet to be understood fully and I think, you know, even though Second Life is sort of moving, has moved to the background, virtual worlds in some way will, they've found a place and they'll, they'll come back into our, they'll come back to our attention again when once more people have uh, more experience of using them and have access and it, and it becomes easier. It has to become a lot easier to use than it is now. Yeah, is there any chance of it becoming web-based? Yeah, I think, well, I think that that's that would be the one of the things, isn't it? You know, the if all you need is to access uh, something like Second Life 
on the web without installing anything and it was pretty straightforward what you had to do then I think that would um, make it a lot easier yeah. or at least provide like a second life light you know where okay if you want yeah. the extra features you can and you have the bandwidth to burn okay you can jump in and do that but mm -hmm. just so others could participate yeah I mean now I think I think it won't be second life that the second wave or the third wave if you like uh, will be something else it'll be something else something new do you think it'll be open sim we'll or I, I found Heike's comments very interesting she was mentioning Google Earth as a possible evolution yeah but then then you I'm not sure about that I mean it, it sounds like a very interesting thing I think it all depends on the amount of e the ease of which people can use something is very important so I think you know as we have found out with Google Plus we already use Google we you know most of us who are in Google Plus now we have Gmail accounts they you know Google Plus was already is already in our um, in our inbox. You know, it's it's on our it's on something we already use. So that makes it much easier to remember it and to keep going back to it. So if if that's the case with whatever comes after Second Life, then I think it'll mean uh, make it a lot easier. So Google is in a good position to to be the successor. Uh, I want to say a quick hello to Dave Wynette, who's joined us. Hello, Dave. Hello, Dave. Future guest on EFL Teacher Hangout. Hi, guys. <laughs> Sorry for the shadow. It's early morning. It's kind of an interesting look you've hey. got going. Yeah. The yeah, shadow like Jedi of some kind. Got my, uh, looks a bit like... EOP. The effect, Dave, looks a little bit like, you know, when, when they do interviews with uh, criminals or victims and they don't want to... Uh, Reveal their identity on TV. <laughs> Top secret. Wow, I hear the waves. Um, so Graham, I, I want to get to a few things before we uh, uh, wrap up. What else has has been the focus of your attention in recent years? Well. Um... I'm doing a lot of uh, work for the British Council on social networking. I manage the, Before you um, get into the specifics, can you talk yeah. a little bit about British Council? Because British Council, I think, plays a kind of a unique role in the, in the world of language learning. I don't know if there's anything like that that, that is everywhere. I mean, any non-English speaking country, there's the British Council doing something interesting, having a pretty good reputation. What are they? How do, how do they do what they do? <sighs> <laughs> yeah, um, well, the the British Council is like a a, a cultural organisation of the UK, really. So um, um, you can find a lot more out about what they do. They do so much um, that it's difficult to sort of summarise. But as far as language learning is concerned, they the um, mission statement, if you like, is to uh, provide all of the teachers and learners of English with the resources that they need. So in other words, the idea is to reach all language teachers and speakers of English in the world, which is quite a, an ambitious... Are they a profit-generating <laughs> entity? And if so, who gets no. the profit? No. No, it's a non-profit organization. It's a registered charity in the UK. Um, they... Um, they're funded partly by government grants, uh, so we're dependent on um, how the government feel about the work that uh, we're doing. And also, um, a lot of the teaching centres in some of the well, uh, teaching centres in some of the countries, for example, Spain, where I work, the teaching centres are run at a profit, but the money that is um, made from the teaching centres there is actually channeled back into project work and other teaching centers that are run at a loss etc i must say it sounds like country. europe is well, investing their money well you know you just hear whenever you hear kind of an interesting project many times well it's funded by the european you know uh, ec or by some european entity so good for you europe 
Uh, yeah. Please uh, continue with what you're, you were talking about, what, uh, what the British Council projects you're involved with. Well, I'll come back to the British Council, but now you mentioned Europe, I think one of the things that um, I've got a lot more involved in is this idea of European projects. My first one was that Avalon project that was a two-year project, seven partners from different parts of Europe based in Second Life. And that got me a, a taste for, for it. I mean, they're, they're fabulous things. They're, it's, they're, it's basically grant money um, provided by the European Union to um, advance education in different sectors of education uh, throughout Europe, and that that in itself is 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 a, a fabulous thing. So there's all these sort of uh, things that are being done, um, and some of them are incredibly successful. And after the you know the two year two years that have taken place go on the idea is that if possible they have a life of their own afterwards and a lot of them do but uh, the the side effect that I didn't really realize until I started doing these European projects was that y you come into contact with other people from other backgrounds cultures other nationalities speaking other languages and it just is such a, a fabulous thing meeting these people and talking to them and working with them and sharing ideas and you know you, you see people's being influenced by the projects and by other people their ideas that you know things opportunities that are presented it's it's just a, a wonderful way of the european union i think of um getting uh, educators to work together without these projects i think this just wouldn't happen and it it, it does feel once you've been part of European project that you, you're far more European than you were before. I mean, I feel a lot more uh, part of Europe now than than I ever did before I did one of these projects. So uh, yeah, <laughs> it's it's a great model. I would I would love to see other regions or or global entities kind of emulate this because it seems cost effective. You know, I, I don't know how much money goes into these, but it seems like reasonable amount, you know, reasonable grant money being pretty effectively spent. And like you say, I think that important part is that it can be continued after the formal project ends. Yeah, that's it. I mean, with any grant money, I think you have to be very careful if you're the, the, the organization giving the grant money, that the money is being spent well, and you do get value for it. And it's not just used um, in a frivolous way. And I think what I've seen is that there, there, there are a lot. What puts a lot of people off before doing these projects is, is that there's a lot of bureaucracy, uh, a lot of layers of, of, you know, a lot of hurdles and hoops you need to um, uh, get across, uh, jump through, etc., before you can, uh, um, you know, get access to the grant money. But I think that's such a great thing, and you know, there's a lot of checks and balances that. Uh, you know, you really do have to make sure that the money has been spent in the right way, that you're doing it for a very good reason. And uh, that, over the years, I think, is something that has developed. Every year it seems to be um, sort of changed a little bit to make it run better, the way things are, are organized. So and tell I'm, us I'm a little bit more about some of the specific projects you have been or are involved with. Yeah, well, again, um, I was invited to do the Avalon project, and then uh, while that was when that was coming to an end, I was invited to two more projects. In fact, I've never, I'm not initiated in any of these projects. Uh, one of them I was invited to because of a tweet I sent. Uh, I sent a tweet, um, uh, so on Twitter, a message saying that I was going to be doing some interactive whiteboard training, and this was picked up on by uh, somebody in my PLN uh, who contacted me by direct message and said oh so you're you're involved in interactive whiteboards that's interesting because I I'm putting together a team for a project on interactive whiteboards would you like to be part of it and so that project started in January that's called iTilt 
Um, uh, and that is looking at um, interactive whiteboards and they've been used in some uh, very, if you like, non-communicative ways. Uh, the idea is to look at language, all languages in Europe. Well, we, we're selecting several of them, but uh, we're aiming at all language teachers in Europe and uh, how they can use the interactive whiteboard in a communicative way. So best practice as far as designing materials and using the board itself. That's a two and a half year project. And then the other one is the one that you heard about um, the other day, Jeff. It was, it's a planet. And a planet, again, I was invited to that uh, probably because of the uh, my involvement with Twitter. And that's a group of us who are, uh, well, a lot of, again, a number of partners based in Europe, different organizations, we're all active in Twitter and uh, have been interested in this idea of a personal learning network of building this up to support teacher development. And it came from the fact that this is all very well with the people who do it and are able to teach themselves. But what about the teachers that are not so technologically savvy? How do they do this? How do they get involved? And, and they really, the, this, through these conversations, the idea of, of mentoring came about, you know, the idea of, of having a mentor. If you have somebody who can help you, who can hold your hand and help you do certain uh, things, then it becomes a lot easier. So we're setting up a, a mentoring system for language teachers who wouldn't normally uh, get involved in social networks and other online tools and trying to um, show them and listen to them and see what they need them for, but show them the value of building a personal learning network. So those are the two projects that I'm involved in at the moment. And I, I just want to apologize to people who are watching the stream. My computer has been freaking out a little bit uh, as I was attempting to silence. I realized I had muted myself in the Hangout, but I had not muted uh, background noises, so you might have heard excessive laughter. <laughs> My wife is enjoying her TV program. Um, <laughs> What's she watching? Uh, so You Think You Can Dance. I downloaded the latest season of So You Think You Can Dance, and uh, it's one of her favorite shows. <laughs> Um, yeah, I found the mentoring, you know, when, when I heard about that, it sounded like a good idea. I'm just wondering, like, that's going on informally all the time. Uh, and yeah. I'm wondering, is it best done in an isolated new project or somehow integrated into existing social networks? Yeah, um... Well, I think we'll find out. I mean, the idea of this is to pilot it and to come up with some recommendations. And hopefully, if it works out and what we do um, is successful, then it'll continue as a, as a model for other people. So that we're, we're, I mean, I must admit, I've not done any mentoring, but um, not any formal mentoring. So my... Uh, I mean, I'm preparing at the moment the mentoring and mentee handbooks for the project. And the first thing I'm doing is actually doing a lot of reading and researching about existing mentoring, especially in language teaching at the moment, because it's, it's a very, um, there's a lot of, a lot of work that has been done about mentoring. A lot of mentoring has been done. Uh, throughout the years on teacher training programs. So it seems like an, an successfully, it's a successful method for teaching, for new teachers. So it seems like a very good way of, of um, introducing teachers to technical, te technology, technology as well, you know. Um, that whether it is or not remains to be seen, but I think we're, we're confident that it'll be successful, but we need to get it right, of course. We've got a a wonderful number of volunteers, uh, associate partners, who um, have said that they're interested in helping us uh, on the project. So 
it won't be for lack of passion or involvement or numbers of people. Uh, so we just have to get everything else right. Vance, as someone who's been mentoring people forever, do you have any insights there? Well, um, I don't think there's ever any problem with starting up another node in the PLN network. You know, I mean, that's what it is. It's a, a PLN, a, a, a network is all the nodes. And as Stephen Downs says, you know, the amount of knowledge in the network is, well, or as George Siemens and the two of them say, you know, the knowledge is whatever, it, what you know is what you can access, you know. So if you're connected, then you can pull that knowledge in. So when you need to know something, um, if you have a network, then there you are. So if I, I suppose if your, your network has to start at a hub somewhere, and if you if your hub is a planet, that's fine, you know. And Webheads is you know another hub. It, it um, reaches it's a, it's the a challenging or, hub to find. Like the <laughs> Webheads are so decentralized <laughs> that it's challenging yeah, to say, uh, call it a hub. Uh, Etienne Winger uh, pointed that out in in the. But I'd like to know what happened to that video, by the way. One of these days, I'm going to ask you about that because it seems to have been lost. But anyway, the uh, not the video. The, no, the um, the the audio I meant is in uh, I can't anyway. I'll, I'll we'll talk about that later. But anyhow, and we are um, coming up to to we've we've taken more than an hour of uh, Graham's time, and I know he's got uh, already a long day of social networking uh, behind him and perhaps ahead of him. Uh, any questions you wanted to uh, ask Graham? Could I just mention the the link I put in the text chat earlier, I'm not sure if it's still there, but anyway I can put it there again, but uh, there, the, the part of the conversation I would have entered at that point was where you mentioned that Heike was um, uh, talking about using Google Earth and that as a basis for uh, Second Life, a Second Life uh, project, and I think Graham in, in the conversation in Second Life at that time said well, it would lose a bit of its fantasy and um, so I just wanted to show you some pictures that somebody has made. Maybe you're aware of them already. I don't know. Anyway, I'll put that link back here. But basically, it's uh, Star Wars in Dubai. So there's there's real world there, plus quite a lot of fantasy uh, objects being sort of superimposed on it. Although uh, I don't... Anyway, on that topic, I don't really know how it would work, whereas, you know, you've got... And you create a fantasy world that goes on forever. The real world is finite. So I kind of with, with uh, Graham on that aspect. But anyway, that's all. Uh, as far as questions, I don't know if I have a question. I'll type it in the text chat while Graham is talking. Well, in that case, Graham, anything else you want to mention, think about, plug? Yeah, I guess I should. One thing we haven't really talked about is uh, the the thing that's been occupying my attention recently has been games. I really think online games is uh, is one of the most interesting areas for language teachers and uh, so because of that a, a couple of years ago um, with a colleague of mine Kyle Moore we started up a blog because we were really um, starting to find that what we were doing in the classroom was uh, really interesting, especially with sort of secondary school teachers. So we set up this blog, Digital Play, and then um, after a number of um, months blogging here, giving sort of practical ideas for teachers on how to use games, especially online games with their classes, we sort of mulled it over and said, you know, there could be a book here and approached a, a, a publisher, Delta Publishers, um, in the UK. And uh, the book's coming out in September, so I'm quite excited about that. Uh, it's a methodology book for teachers. It'll be my sort of first book. So so what's a, a day in the life like of Graham Stanley these days? Well, at the moment, uh, it's... Um, I'm, I'm sort of working part time at the moment. The teaching stopped until uh, the end of August, 
So I've got time now to sort of do things like this <laughs> and um, also catch up on lots of other things. I'm doing project work at the moment during the day and um, as I said, catching up. During most of the year, that the case is that, you know, I wake up in the morning and I'm busy until uh, the end of the day and then often at the weekends as well. It just depends. Um, I don't know quite what to say about a typical day. I think a typical day is just busy is, is the word that I'd have to use. I like variety. I like being uh, sort of involved in lots of different things like yourself and Vance, I think, as well. And that's that's the thing that drives me, if you like. Meeting and how do you maintain and... your sanity, your balance, your quality offline time? Do you have such a thing? Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, um, I just, I think if I'm interested in something that I don't, you know, that to me is as good as a holiday, you know. So if it's something that I'm particularly interested in, then... And would your wife not... agree? Well, yeah, she's she's pretty much the same as me, fortunately. Uh, you know, she at the moment is completely obsessed with blogging. So she's started uh, up a lot of... she. You know, her thing is writing. She's a very good writer. And, um, you know, she's as well as trying to sort of get a... Um, a collection of short stories in Spanish published, or maybe we're gonna, she's gonna publish them herself, I think now. Then, you know, she's done a lot of other writing for TV and stuff. Um, and she's just discovered blogging. And she, she spends so much time online blogging and using Facebook and Twitter to promote this and to con connect with other people as well. That, you know, we're, we're two of a kind, if you like, so. She spends as much time online, if not more sometimes than me, if you can believe that. <laughs> um, all right, why don't we go ahead and uh, wrap this up officially, but stay on for a post show. We have a couple comments from Watchdog in the chat room that I want to uh, address and also say hello to Don, who's joined us. But first, Graham, thank you very much for uh, taking the time tonight to play and for playing and doing such interesting things and sharing them uh, over the years. Thank you for inviting me, Jeff. It's been a pleasure.